Okay, so now it's recording. So I've just forked, uh, just forked the kill platoon stock picker repo into mine. So now I have it available, so I can clone it. Okay, so now I've got uh, all the files here that I've cloned. I'm going to go ahead and do it in Python. So if we check out the README first. Okay, so what we're going to do is basically we get an array of numbers and we want to get, you know, it's framed as stocks, but we just want to get the largest positive difference between one number and a, a number that comes after that number. So some constraints here, uh, we can only, you know, buy and sell once and we have to buy before we sell. Um, so that's, I think those are the basics. So we, we're going to get an array. We're also going to return an array and that array is going to be the index of where the, the first, like the buy day and the, and the sell day occur. Okay. So we've got uh, our spec file. This has got some examples. I'm going to go ahead and for now, write my own simpler spec. So picker, so I, I've noticed, you know, talking people through different solutions the last couple of days that people tend to start when you're, people tend to start with very large uh, test cases like this. This is a pretty large test case, right? So ideally you want to be able to kind of walk through your code line by line and, you know, by hand or by eye, however you want to think about it. Um, say what everything's doing. So you want to pick the simplest case possible that's going to um, that this it's going to work. So in this case we'll just do one, two, four, something like that. So that way we, we're not starting off with an array with 10 items, right? Because the kind of minimum useful case would be three. You could do one or two. But those are more, those are more edge cases. Okay, so for picker, um, we'll start with just the kind of a, a brute force approach where we want to check every single item in the array. So we want to check every single item in the array, and then we want to compare that with basically every other item in the array. So we start with one. So we get one, and we're going to go one with two. Okay, so if I buy on, if I buy at one and sell at two, I make a $1 profit. So that's my maximum profit. So I'm probably going to need to remember that. So I have my maximum profit is one. And then I'm going to go, go again. So one and four. So one and four gives me a maximum profit of three. So that's good. So I can save that. But I still need to test other cases. So what if what if this number is even, what if this number is zero instead of one? Well, I'll need to test that too. So I'm gonna have to shift over one and then I'm gonna have to do the same thing. I'm gonna have to test every item with, uh, with every other item. So I'll test two and four, I get a profit of two, which is less than the profit I got that I had already checked. So I know that this is not gonna be more profitable. So I can keep what I have here. So I know that my max profit will be three and I can save the indexes of the arrays where that occurred. So we're gonna need to basically use a double for loop or a for loop inside of a for loop. So that way we can kind of, we can go one, two, one, four, and two, four. So we'll start with that. Can you just zoom in just a little bit by any chance? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so let's just go ahead and start with, we're not gonna worry about saving data or comparing things. We're just gonna start with the looping. We just wanna make sure that we can run over all of the items that we need to run over. So let's start with for loops. Um, so we think about what kind of for loop, maybe what flavor of for loop we want. We, we don't just care about the values we get. We also care about the indexes, right? So we're, we're going to want to keep track of both the value 
and the index. And the kind of sensible tool for that in Python is to use uh, enumerate in the for loop. So that gives you access to both the index and the value in an array. For index, and we'll do price. Yeah, actually, we'll uh, let's call this day because that's kind of what it's supposed to represent. So for day price in uh, enumerate prices, but we don't just want to go through once, um, at least not in, in, in this version. We're going to want to check every single one with every single other one, which means we're going to have to double that. So for day, let's do second day. I'll change just the first day. Uh, first day or second day price in enumerate prices. We'll go ahead and print. Um, let's just go ahead and print uh, all the information that we get. Print, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the indexes. So first, uh, whoops. First day, second day. All right, LSCD. Stock picker and CD Python. And we'll go ahead and run the stock picker. So pi. All right, so my array, I get uh, 0, 1, sorry, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, and then I get one zero one 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 two two zero two one two two so that makes sense i'm going over every single uh element so i i'm now capable of kind of accessing all of the information that i need there's a slight problem here though and in, in that one of our constraints is that we have to uh, buy before we sell so if this second day is our sell day, right? So this is our, at least our potential sell day, we're gonna have to buy first. So the first day is gonna have to come first and the second day is gonna have to come second. So we know that our first day, our, our second day can never, can never be our first day. And let's say it also can't be you know, uh, the first day. So we're, we're gonna have to exclude that case. So what I'm gonna do here is if, if uh, second day is less than or equal to first day, I'm just going to continue. And you can write uh, if else statements on the first line in Python if there's only one line. This is a fairly simple one. So I, I could also write this like this. So either one will be fine. I'll just, this is kind of a throwaway line. So I'm just going to leave it like that. And then if I run this again, I get a, a limited subset of this array traversal that will actually conform to the basic constraints that the, the problem is giving us. So we test the zero the zero with index with the first one, the zero with with the second one, and then the first index with the second index. So now we have the basic our basic traversal plan. So this is kind of, I would say this is most of the battle right here, just figuring out uh, how we're actually gonna move through this. So now we know how we're gonna move through it. Instead of printing all this stuff, what, what we wanna do is we wanna test if the, uh, the values at the first day and the second day, we wanna check that and see if it's greater than any previous maximum that we have, right? So we wanna be able to store a, a maximum value and then check it here. So let's go ahead and add that variable now. And then we'll call it max profit. And we could use zero or just pick an arbitrary number, but we could also choose the lowest possible number in Python, which is 
float and then negative infinity. So uh, zero would be fine, but if you want to be a little bit more thorough, you can choose the lowest possible number because it's possible we could have, you know, a loss could potentially be the, depending on how we design the algorithm, a loss could be the, the most profit you could make or the, the best you could do anyway. So we've got that, we've got our max profit, but we also need to return something, right? So we need to return an array that has the days that we bought and sold. And those days are gonna be indexes. So we have um, buy, sell days. And for now, we'll just set that equal to an array with zero because we don't, know anything yet. Okay, so now that we know our, we have a, this max profit so we can save a value through iterations in the for loop and we have our buy sell days. So let's go ahead and check whatever value we get for every single combination of days. And we'll check and see if that is bigger than max profit. So if, uh, Actually, let's do, call this first price and second price. <clears throat> so if the second price uh, minus the first price, if that is greater than the max profit, then what we want to do is we want to change max profit. We want to update the, the max profit variable. So we'll go ahead and do max profit equals second price minus first price. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and print just to, you know, we'll do a little sanity check, make sure everything's working. And let's, at the end of our for loop, let's see what our max profit is. So if we look at our test array, our initial input, we would expect it to be three, right? So one and four would be the maximum possible profit you can get. So we're, we're looking for three. So print max profit. Three, okay. So this none is because I'm printing uh, and I don't have a return value. All right, so it looks like this is working. Um, we could try a few more test cases. If we were doing this more thoroughly in a test-driven development manner, we would be writing increasingly complex test cases to, to, to kind of keep us on track. But again, for the sake of time, we're, we're skipping that. Okay, so now I've got I've got something I can iterate through. I can touch all of the elements in the array that I need that I need to. I can determine what the max profit is, but we don't just need the max profit. We need the buy sell days. So we'll just tweak this a little bit. So we can change the max profit and then we can also update the, the days and we can grab that. So, so when we know that our max profit has been updated, we should also be updating the, the buy sell days, right? And we can grab those with the first day and the second day here. So we'll do buy sell days equals new array, um, first day, second day. And then what we need to return is the buy sell days. All right, let's see what we get here. Get zero and two. So that looks that looks right so far, but this is only one test case. So, you know, maybe we're missing something. Maybe we chose our test case badly. We're not accounting for edge cases and, and all kinds of things. Uh, we can go ahead and let's try from stock picker and port picker. Okay, so we can try running the spec file now and see what we get.
Okay, true, 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 true. So it looks like that works fine. Um, so again, we, we could keep doing it, uh, adding test cases, looking for edge cases, testing for input. So, I mean, there's definitely things we could do to make this more robust, but here's a, a basic solution. It's not ideal. So if we think about, we haven't, again, we haven't talked about this, but we're talking about it anyway. So uh, the runtime complexity. So the runtime complexity of this code is basically, uh, it's kind of an abstract, uh, an abstract way of thinking about how efficient code is. But so we have an array with three elements, right? So our input has three things in it. And then we're looping through this. Um, we have two for loops. So although, uh, although we have a, a restricted uh, second for loop, we can kind of ignore that and say that for every, for every additional input we have, we're gonna have to run that many squared more operations, right? So if we have three things that we're inputting, we have a double for loop, we're gonna have to run six operations, right? And if we, we uh, printed that out here, or sorry, not six, uh, nine, apparently. So uh, three squared, so nine. Um, and if we add one more, so that's four, so that's gonna be 16. So we, we, add, we just added one more, but now we have to do what, seven more operations. So every time we add one piece of data, we have to do an you know, exponentially larger number of operations. So that's fine for just you know, when our array is three or even you know, 100 or something. But if our array were a million or a billion elements long, then this algorithm would rapidly become impractical. So there, uh, there is potentially another way of uh, another way of doing this. So we can, I'll just comment this out. So this will be like a first pass. So if, if you got this, that's great. Um, so getting a solution is great. However, you know, whatever, whatever type the solution is. So we'll do O of N, whoops. that squared. <clears throat> so it's, there's usually a way to go from O of N squared to something that's not O of N squared, something that's a little bit more efficient. So um, in the interest of time, I don't think I'm gonna actually code, I think I'll just kind of copy paste it and then we can talk about it. So here's another, alternative solution, which is just a little bit different, but uh, notice here that we're only, we're only running the for loop once. But we have up here, we had two you know, pieces of data. And down here, in order to get this to work, we have to add another piece of data. So we've increased our runtime or we've increased our runtime efficiency, but we've decreased our memory efficiency. So oftentimes COBOL, so we're you know, talking about object orientation versus uh, functional programming, or when should I do this? Or what's the best way to do that? And you know, all these kind of questions that it may be frustrating for you that there isn't always just a clear answer. Uh, part of the answer is that there are always trade-offs for these things. So if you have, for whatever reason, say a very memory locked application, then it's possible that a solution like this, even though it's faster, might not be viable or it might not be worth the trade-off. So you might, even though like, you know, officially this is a better solution, um, it might be the case that in your particular use case that you, you need to go with, uh, you know, the less ideal solution to some, to some extent. But uh, so just, just uh, a quick note about trade-offs and thinking about 
programming. So a, a lot of what you know, people interviews are going to be looking at is uh, not necessarily just do you know the algorithm, like can you solve this uh, coding challenge, and not even can you solve it in the most efficient way possible, but can you kind of talk about why you would do one thing versus another thing. So here we've got uh, just like the, the first one, we have an array that we're gonna need to return, which is gonna represent the buy sell days. We have max profit. So we're also gonna need to keep track of that. So that's just like this one, but we've introduced this new third variable, which is lowest day. So what, what we're gonna do instead of going through the algorithm, essentially going through everything twice or uh, n squared, we're going to just go through it once and we're going to take whatever value is there and then calculate the potential uh, max profit. So we're still gonna loop through everything. We're gonna get the, the day and the price and we're gonna check if the current price is less than the price at whatever lowest day. And we're starting at zero because that's the beginning of the array, right? So we're starting on the first day and we're checking, so it's kind of a redundant check, right? It's, it's gonna be, it's, it's going to be zero anyway, but so we're checking if, if the current price is less than the, uh, the price on the lowest day. If it is, then whatever day we're on is going to be the, the lowest, the lowest day. Okay. So we're, we're going to have a lowest day and, and we're going to save this. So as we traverse the array, we're going to need to hold on to that piece of information because we're need, going to need to use it to to, to do our like final check, right? Can I ask you really quick? Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, where max profit is um, inside the um, parentheses, what does that mean again, the, the quotation marks, the I, INF? Yeah, so this is just like, a, I don't know if you would call it a trick, but it's just a thing in Python that you can do to give you the lowest number that Python can represent. So again, for here, like using just zero would be fine, but if you really wanted to make sure that you were starting at the very bottom, then you could do something like this. So a float is a, you know, a, a basically a, a decimal number. And th this is just the somewhat quirky way that, that you can represent the lowest number that Python can represent. Got it, thanks. Okay. Okay. So then we're gonna need, just like we did above, we're gonna need to check our current profit, right? So if we have the lowest day, the, you know, the, the price, the day with the lowest price saved, we can then compare whatever current day we're on and say, is that greater than max profit? If it is, then again, we're gonna find out what that profit is and save it to max profit, just like we did above. And then what we're gonna do is assign that, the, the indexes to days, and then we're gonna return dates. So it's very similar, except that we're keeping track of whatever the current lowest uh, stock price is. So we need to hold on to that value as, as we make comparisons. So this you know, uh, is not the most intuitive solution. Um, and if it doesn't make sense immediately, that's fine. I'll go ahead and push it up and you can take a look at it at your leisure, but let, we can go ahead and run it just to make sure that it actually works. Okay, so that does work. I'll get rid of the print statement. Okay, so I'm gonna push this up. So I've got my code, I've written it. Um, I wanna now push it back up. So I'm gonna do git status. Actually, I'm gonna need to go. Okay, so a couple of things. I have this pi cache uh, thing in here. So what if I don't wanna, what if I don't want any pi cache files? Cause I shouldn't, I shouldn't need to, that's not something you need to push up to a repo. 
so, something you can ignore. Yes. So let's go ahead and okay. What so is that the cache file? It uh will generate so you won't be able to read it, but it's basically the compiled uh, Python. So when you execute your code, if you know your code doesn't just run directly on the machine. There's one or two intermediate processes. So it, it just saves this in case you run it again, it doesn't have to generate the file. So the, the first time you run it, it will do this. It's it's like, you know, it's not a noticeable, uh, it's not a noticeable performance hit or anything like that. Would you do that by uh, right clicking? Do what? How did you um, get it to get it more? How, did you right click or how did you do that? The pie cash. Uh, it, it's not ignored yet. Oh. I was just I was just looking at it and showing you that it's basically it's it's not in a format that's this readable. So it's lower level code. But but we want to now ignore pie cash. So all you have to do in our git ignore is We just put the name of the file and notice that this went from green to grayed out. So now we don't have to push up uh, extraneous files up to our uh, GitHub repo. So we just have what we need here. We've got the stock query spec, uh, which we should have written tests for, but didn't. And then the actual solution. Okay. So it looks like let's do git uh, status again. Okay, so we've added a git ignore, change stock picker. Um, so let's go ahead and do uh, git add, git status. This, this may need to be in a slightly higher. So let's see. Um, Chris showed me one of the TAs the other day showed me that there is an extension that you can put on that will create the git ignore folder for you. Um, real quickly. Yeah, so that's probably good. So um, most of the stuff you get ignored is going to be default. Okay, so Julie, what's the name of that extension? Get ignore templates. It is by Asan Ali. Okay, so now my code is pushed up. And if I refresh, you should be able to see I have uh, a new commit 15 seconds ago. So now I want to make a pull request. Make pull request, pull request tab, new pull request, create pull request. And it's my initial commit. And that's that. So my commit is now here. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing. I will 